thank everybody, Selfie, for doing an awesome job of organizing, Dr. Kong and many of my old friends and colleagues. And I, before I proceed, I'd like to introduce my travel mates. Um, Heather and Emma are OR nurses from Toronto, and most of you have met Anne, who's a, a rising star, future neurosurgeon superstar. Um, so I thought today, rather than talking about a weight craniotomy, um, I'd talk about something a little bit more interesting and provocative. Paul, oh, can you put the first slide on, please? And it's about decision making. This morning at rounds, a number of you presented cases. And I asked questions about why did you do this? Why didn't you do that? What was your decision making process? So how do we decide what the best thing to do is? When an epidural hematoma comes in in the middle of the night and there's a little depression, how do we decide what the right thing to do is? So um, I guess you're going to have to operate the slides, Evan. Sorry. Next. So I've, I've framed this talk around oncology, but it applies to any aspect of neurosurgery. Here's an example, 33-year-old woman with no metastatic melanoma presents with a seizure, and MRI discloses two lesions. <coughs> so how would you treat this in, uh, at Hassan Sadiqin? She's 33, it's melanoma, she doesn't have any other cancer in her body, how would you treat her? One of the residents. You can't be wrong, so don't be shy. Uh, depending on what her presenting symptoms Seizures only. Uh, seizures, then probably I do an EEG to see which one's the uh, focus for the seizure and take that out, maybe. So take out maybe the big one? Uh, the one with the symptoms. If okay. it was the big one, yes. Okay, let's say it's the big one. You take it out, what would you do about the little one? We'll do an observation, maybe a, year, a six month leave. Observation for metastatic melanoma? When you do the observation in six months, we'll have to be at the morgue, right? She's going to die. So how, she's only 33. How can we treat her? We could remove both. We can do radiation. We can do focused radiation. So, so here's a list. In, in our, we have gamma knife radio surgery, which you have in Jakarta, right? Yeah. But not here. So, so these are nine options for treatment. Nine, and they're all good options. So how do you decide? It's like going to a restaurant, and there are nine things you want on the menu. How do you decide which one? So how do we decide? What guides our decision making? So we, we tried to answer this by talking to surgeons and asking them, so the factors that, that weigh on us when we make a decision are patient factors like age, what the patient wants, what the data tells us if they're randomized studies, the surgeon's training, eh? This is the big one. Like what you guys learn here will be the biggest factor in determining how you proceed in your, in your life. Your personal experience. Maybe you, the last case you did a certain way worked badly, mm -hmm. so you'll do something different for the next situation. Your personal understanding of the disease process. Like I don't believe that gliomas are improved by attempting a radical resection, like 100% resection. So that isn't part of my decision making. So it's, it's about my understanding of a particular disease. 
And then if the surgeon champions a certain procedure, I do awake craniotomies. I've done thousands of them, so I tend to make that decision more than other surgeons might. And then, of course, availability of resources. You can't treat that woman with gamma knife in, in Bandung because you don't have it unless you want to send her away, right? And then biases. We all have biases. We come to work with biases every day. So let's talk a little bit about biases. These are really important for you to be aware of. So I'm just going to spend a minute on each of these types of bias. You may, some of you may have heard these expressions. Some of you may not have heard these expressions. But there is a literature on bias. So premature closure bias refers to, this is the most common type it occurs when physicians jump to conclusions and do not consider other possibilities. And closure in the title means closure of the mind. You premature close your mind. You know, a patient with melanoma comes in, you see it, they have a seizure, you see a spot on the brain, you say, oh, it's metastatic melanoma. But in fact, it's a tuberculoma because you didn't consider all the options. So here's an example. A woman with a long history of migraine complains of severe headache and her doctor jumps to the conclusion that she must have just had another migraine, but he actually ends up having a brain tumor. So the, pay, the doctor closed their mind after they heard the diagnosis of migraine. They need to keep their mind open, okay? And one disease does not define a patient. Attribution bias involves a negative stereotypes that lead clinicians to ignore the possibility of other serious diagnoses. A known drug user, complains of back pain and is assumed to be seeking drugs, but he actually has a lumbar tumor, which is missed. Again, so the doctor jumped to a conclusion. Affective bias, when sympathy is shown to a patient at the cost of avoiding unpleasant but not unnecessary tests and examinations. An example this morning, one of the patients didn't get a CT who should have had a CT because maybe they didn't want to pay or the doctor felt compassionate and didn't want to ask them to pay for the CT, but that was the wrong thing to do for that patient. That patient needed a CT. So a patient with an eloquently located brain tumor fears having an awake craniotomy. The surgeon complies and does the surgery under general anesthetic when she gets a neurological deficit, which likely would have been avoided with awake surgery. So that's uh, making an affective bias decision that hurts the patient. <laughs> Availability bias. This occurs when clinicians' recent experiences and guide him or her to overestimate or underestimate the probability of a disease. And availability refers to the availability of a memory in your brain. A neurosurgeon sees many patients with brain enhancing lesions that are usually malignant brain tumors and forgets to consider infective etiologies in a patient recently seen, and they actually end up having brain abscess. So again, gliomas are common, infections are less common, although they're more common in your world than mine. We're more likely to make this mistake than you guys. Representation bias, when clinicians judge the probability of a disease based on the clinical picture without considering the prevalence in the population. A 37-year-old man with lung cancer and severe back and leg pain is suspected of having a metastatic tumor. In fact, he simply has a common lumbar disc herniation. And we see many patients with malignant diseases or AIDS or other terrible things who have simple lumbar discs and we take them up because it's a quality of life thing. We don't exclude them from getting a simple operation because they have a, a terminal diagnosis. Anchoring bias. When a clinician firmly stands by his or her initial evaluation and impression, even if data, and some of you are smiling, many of us will stand our ground. I don't care what the data says. I don't care what the other doctors say. I don't care what the literature says. I know. And we, we make that mistake as surgeons. The 37-year-old man presenting with a neurosurgeon sticks to his guns that he must have a metastasis in spite of the MRV more suggestive of discrimination. This results in numerous expensive further tests, which are all negative, and delay the simple treatment of having a lumbar discectomy. So that's anchoring to an initial impression. An individual bias. This is huge, eh? All of you are going to form your impressions of how gliomas should be treated, and how lumbar discs should be treated, 
and how you know, spinal motor thesis should be treated, and how an aneurysm should be treated. This is a decision based on the clinician's training, strength, and comfort zone. You'll leave this program feeling more comfortable doing this case than doing that case, or doing this case that way instead of that way. And that's going to determine how you approach the case. A neurosurgeon usually does not strive for gross total resection because he or she does not believe that the extent of resection significantly uh, affects survival and it increases the risk of neurological deficit. So that's based on somebody's world view of the disease. <coughs> and then confirmation bias follows from that. The tendency to search for, interpret, and recall information in a way that confirms the clinician's belief. So you may present a case and say, I did it this way because this study shows that this is the best way. But there might be seven studies that show it's not the best way. And you stick with that study to justify what you did. We all do it. A neurosurgeon supports his stance on the lack of need for gross total resection by pointing out how poor the published evidence is. And I'm going to show you a personal example of this bias in a few minutes. So I'm going to segue from, from, uh, from the concept of decision making to decision making in low grade glioma. Are all of you a, a little aware of the controversies with low grade glioma? Surgery versus wait and see? Do you use the wait and see approach? You do. So when do you decide to do the wait and see approach? Very quickly, just you, uh, Petra, isn't it? Yes. So, so very quickly, you know, in a few words, what, what patient would you treat with the wait and see as opposed to operating? So with uh, minimal clinical uh, symptoms. Minimal clinical symptoms, maybe just a seizure. Yeah. And uh, if the lesion confirms to low grade, I mean, like, it doesn't enhance, there's not much oh. mass effect or edema. Brilliant. I will probably do a wait and see. Brilliant. Okay. And maybe also eloquence. Yes, it's right in the speech area. So, so that's great. That's exactly the right answer. But a lot of people don't agree with that. Eh? A lot of people suggest that every low grade gliomas should be treated aggressively. So I'll show you an example of the dilemma. And you've all seen this, but this is a really good example from my practice. So this is a 45 year old man with focal seizure only. And this rather complex one, not routine low grade. Who, who here would be would be have a tendency to treat up front or use the wait and see? Treat up front, hands up. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. You can't be wrong. Wait and see. Come on, only four people put their hands up. You can't abstain. Wait and see. Hands up. Treat up front. So a whole bunch of you are checking. You didn't abstain. You didn't vote. You got to vote. Anyway, everybody's right, right? Because yes. we don't know the right answer. But but this this example uh, this example demonstrates um, something. Oh, it didn't work. Oh dear, something happened. Okay, so that's too bad. I had something written at the bottom. Somehow it fell off the slide. So this was actually not his initial MRI. This is his 14-year MRI. So I chose the wait and see 17 years ago. I followed him for 14 years, no operation, working as a construction guy, doing fine. <coughs> Three years ago, it turned into a glioblastoma, and he died a year ago. But 14 years, he was saved in operation, he was saved neurological deficit. So this shows the biological variability of the disease and why we don't have to operate on every case. That's weird that how that fell off the slide. So, we, we talked about this before. The treatment options for this case are aggressive resection, plus or minus <coughs> adjuvant treatment, image guided biopsy, plus or minus adjuvant treatment, wait and see, no upfront treatment, just monitoring with regular MRIs. Wow, that's bizarre. My, the slides are play, playing tricks on me. <laughs> I must have put them into a Mac or something. That, that Mac yesterday must have, must have destroyed all my slides. So what are the challenges of treatment planning for low-grade glioma? And this is an important thing because you guys are going to see this every week or every month in your practice. You're going to see a 29-year-old you know, lawyer with his first seizure and no neurological deficit, what to do. So it's a disease.